welcome. Thanks for joining us for our first Friday Forum today. We are joined by Lissa Holland, the Executive Director at the Lancaster Public Library, and Aaron Sherman, the Board President. And they're going to be telling you all about their very exciting $10 million new project, which is going to be the new library opening in Yule Plaza later this spring. And we're going to keep the program a little bit shorter today. Uh, we'll probably have time for maybe one or two questions here. And if you're joining us on the live stream, just drop your questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring them. Um, but we're going to finish up a little early so that we can invite all of you to actually walk over to Yule Plaza with us and join us for a hard hat tour of the new library. I've heard construction is well underway and we're gonna see some exciting stuff over there. So I hope you can all join us. Um, there's a lot of action in Yule Plaza today because they are trying to finish up Yule Plaza uh, later this month. So we'll get a, kind of an update on what's going on over there and get to check out the library. So excited for that. And um, before I hand over the program, I just wanna thank our sponsors who make the first Friday forums possible which is Rogers and Associates, been very generous supporters, and the Wear Center for hosting us. So thank you all so much for being here, and I'm gonna hand it over to you, Jim. Thank you. So I was asked at the beginning if I know how to use one of these, I said forward and backward, right? And, oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> So, hi everyone. Uh, so thanks for being here. Thank you to Hourglass for hosting us. Um, thank you, Diana, for all your help in getting set up today. Um, as Diana mentioned, my name is Aaron Sherman. I'm the board chair of the Lancaster Public Library. I've been a member of the board since 2016. Um, it has been a, a very long road to get to where we are right now, but we are really thrilled to be here to tell you what we're up to um, and what things are gonna look like as we turn the page to our next chapter. We begin every board meeting by reading our mission. Um, this helps to ground us and guide every decision we make, every conversation that we have. It all comes back to this. Um, at the risk of being one of those people who stands in front of you and reads words off a of PowerPoint, I'm gonna read you our mission because it's important. The Lancaster Public Library inspires, empowers, and strengthens our community by connecting people with information, ideas, and enriching experiences. That is the core of who we are and what we do. If you only wanted to know one thing about us, that's it. Now let me tell you a little bit about the scope of how we serve our community. Now, all the statistics that you see up here, those are all from 2019, because that was our last non-COVID affected year. Um, and since then, we've seen all of our statistics reach and then exceed pre-pandemic levels. So leading up to 2019, uh, we had an average of over 350,000 visitors every year. Um, in that same year, Gallup released a poll that showed that visiting the library is the most popular cultural activity in the United States. So more people visit libraries than go to concerts, than go to museums, than go to the movies. Libraries are the most popular cultural activity in the United States. Um, we have over 700,000 items circulated every year, including books and a whole lot of other things that I'm gonna tell you more about. Uh, Three million retrievals of electronic information, so this includes internet se sessions, database searches, things like that. Um, COVID was obviously a challenge for us, just as it was for every organization that relies on any kind of in-person services. Um, so we adapted the way that people learned how to, right? We offered a lot of online resources, uh, we offered contactless curbside pickup for people to pick up books and other materials. Um, but the staff also got very creative in ways to engage the community. For example, we had a grab bag service where if, if you tell a librarian, I like historical nonfiction and graphic novels, um, they would put together a selection of books for you to pick up, um, a surprise to you. And that was a really creative way to stay engaged during a time that was very hard to stay engaged in. Um, COVID was also a good opportunity for us to kind of rethink the design of our library, because we were sort of well along the path of designing our new building when COVID hit and taught us all kinds of lessons that we never could have known in terms of what we need in a building to serve the future. So Lisa will talk more about that, but you'll see all kinds of flexible spaces that can be arranged in different ways, um, flexible ways for the staff to interact with the public. Uh, we'll really kind of be the first new building in Lancaster to really incorporate the lessons of the pandemic into our design, which is an exciting thing to do. 
Um, we offer lots of programming on our own, um, but we also partner with many local organizations to expand our offerings, right? I mean, there, as you all know, there are lots of organizations, nonprofit and for-profit within our community um, that do an incredible job of serving us in different ways. So where we can, we like to partner to both grow the capacity of the library and grow the capacity of our partner organizations. Um, we, for example, with the YWCA, we are uh, co-hosting a Dorothy Heights Justice Book Club. Um, Lisa will tell you more about uh, one of the most important partnerships that we've had lately, which is with the, the Lancaster Parking Authority in our new building. Um, this is just a, a small sample of the groups that, that we're working with. So now I want to address um, a concept that some of you may have of a library as a musty old institution. Um, so we're 260 years old, so yes, we are old, um, but we're very much built for the future. Um, of our 58,000 cardholders, you'll see a chart here that breaks down our cardholders in, into different generations. And you'll notice that the largest contingent of cardholders by age are millennials. Then you add in Gen Z, which is those who are about 10 to 25 year old, years old right now. Millennials and Gen Z together make up 56% of our cardholders, more than half. So, Lancaster Public Library is a dynamic organization. We serve a wide range of people from all backgrounds and all ages in many different ways. Um, and clearly, the demand for what we do is there now and will remain into the future. Um, when you think of libraries, you probably think of books. We have a lot of those. Um, well, we also have tons of other resources that we offer. Um, the Duke Street Business Center helps budding entrepreneurs get the resources they need to start new businesses. Um, our Autism Resource Center is used by lots of families all across Lancaster County to get resources that they can't find elsewhere. Um, we lease out Wi-Fi hotspot devices, all kinds of electronic services like uh, e-books, audio books, um, streaming services. We have programming for both young and old. Um, and we have all kinds of other items in our collection like American Girl dolls, museum passes, musical instruments, lawn games. Um, so it, it is definitely an, an organization that is built to, as we say in our mission, connect people with information, ideas, and enriching experiences. It all goes back to that. The library is very much in demand, and we are continually finding new ways to stay relevant in the 21st century. And we're being leaned on by the community now more than ever. Um, even with the uh, interruptions of COVID in 2021, our reference librarians answered over 2,000 questions last year. And the more information that's available, the more critical their services become. And I mean, we live in the information age, right? Um, and if I asked you who the president of Zambia is, you probably don't know, but you could probably also take out your phone and give me an answer really quickly. The role of a librarian in an age like this is to search and vet and curate information. There was an author, Neil Gaiman, he wrote, who wrote uh, Coraline, um, and he said that Google can bring you back 100,000 answers, a librarian can bring you back the right one. So we are sort of arbiters of information in the information age when it is so freely available. And speaking of our librarians, we have the most MLS holding librarians in Lancaster County, MLS's Masters of Librarian Services. We also have over 100 volunteers that help us uh, you know, through our operations on an ongoing basis. And that is separate and above the literally hundreds of other volunteers that help through our friends organizations, they help with book sales, uh, we have our board members and committee members. Um, this is an organization that people really do show up for in a real way. It's kind of hard to really understand Lancaster Public Library without understanding our funding model. So we raise, our, our budget, um, is over 63% library generated. So that means that almost two thirds of our budget comes from fundraising mostly, as well as fines and fees. In the state of Pennsylvania, there are two libraries that consistently raise more funds than us, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. We're, no, we're number three behind them. Um, so yeah, that's great, right? We raise all that money. Uh, but then it raises the question of, why do you have to raise all that money, right? Um, glad you asked. So this next chart, this shows um, average library funding nationwide. Um, so this, this was uh, from a few years ago. So if you look across this country, the vast majority of libraries get the vast majority of their funding from local government. So 
average uh, national statistic is that a library receives $37.62 from their local government per person in their service area per year. So if a library has a service area with a population of $100,000, on average, they're going to get $3.7 million from their local government every year to do that. While the national average is $37.62, Lancaster Public Library receives $1.49 from local government per capita per year. So we are receiving roughly four cents on the dollar of the national average from our local government. Um, statewide, the percentage gap isn't, isn't quite so severe, but it's really that local funding that forms the backbone um, for libraries across the country, and that is really the reason that we need to be raising and generating the kind of money that we do. This next chart here that you see, this is specific to the roughly 450 public libraries within Pennsylvania and where Lancaster Public Library ranks um, in a number of statistics. So we are number four in terms of library-generated revenue. I mentioned Philly and Pittsburgh are the only libraries that raise more than us. York is technically included in this because they serve the entire school district there, um, but that's no longer the case. Um, we are number eight in terms of all the libraries in Pennsylvania. We have the eighth largest service area. Then if you look down towards the bottom of the slide, um, that's where things get a little bit bleak. Um, of the 450 libraries in Pennsylvania, we are ranked number 429 in the number of staff that we have to serve our population. Of the 450 libraries in Pennsylvania, we are ranked 439th in the local funding that we receive from our government here. So these create a lot of challenges. Um, Lissa and her staff, they do an unbelievable job of serving the community with very limited resources. Um, but without a doubt, every conversation we have, every decision we make is really based on what our funding looks like. Um, so we like to often fantasize about what we could be doing if we had a reliable funding stream. Um, but we are very committed to continuing to serve the community. We've done so for 260 years. Um, we have a lot of exciting things coming up um, to expand our ability to serve the community. Um, so that's kind of an overview of who we are as a library, how we serve this community, um, and what our funding model looks like. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lissa to talk a little bit about um, our future home and modern libraries in general. You mean in terms of like the nationwide averages? Or it, even in the state of Pennsylvania, comparatively to the other communities? Yeah, so it, it really varies. Um, you know, the sort of the ideal funding model um, is that a library is essentially an arm of the government, right? And they, they're fully funded that way. So in some cases, it is a city. In some cases, it's a county. Um, in Pennsylvania, the majority of our libraries are not funded that way. Um, but nationwide, it's it, it really runs. Sorry. Yeah. No, not at all. Any other questions at this point? Thank you. Well, as Diane had said, and Aaron, my name is Lissa Holland. I'm the executive director of Lancaster Public Library, and I too want to reiterate what Aaron said to thank. The Hourglass Foundation and where for hosting us today so that we can share our excitement about our new home, which is only a block away. You have to warm up your fingers a little bit. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> As I'm sure all of you know, this is a picture of our present building. The cornerstone has the date of 1953, and we had a ribbon cutting in 1954. This building has served us well. We have enjoyed being in it, but it does not enable us to be a modern library. It doesn't meet those needs. And how could it? In the 70 years that we have been in this building, Public libraries have changed drastically. They are not an institution that has its own little box and that you stay in it. It's a much more vibrant, flexible area. 
And in fact, we were planning, in the midst of planning, how are we going to renovate this building? What is feasible? Who will support it? What should we do? When a plot twisting opportunity came along and we were thrilled with it. This opportunity was made possible by John Meter, Larry Cohen and Lancaster Parking Authority, and Mayor Sirachi in the city of Lancaster. We were asked to anchor the first two floors of the new Christian Street parking garage. We were thrilled with this because it would give us the ability to design the space, a blank, empty box space, and to make, meet our needs of what a modern library should be. Plus, we were excited that for the first time in a long while, we would be tenants putting all of our focus on serving the community and not having the responsibility of being an owner of a building. Literally, we are moving a block, but we think it's miles away because we really believe that our new home will be the heart of the city, where we can interact more closely with other organizations to partner together to better serve this community. In fact, our very first event is coming next month. It will be held in Ewell Plaza long before we even move there. We will have, um, we are teaming with the city to present children's programming in conjunction with the Hispanic Heritage Month. As Erin said, we used the pandemic to make some changes to our design. Never did we think we would need spaces to separate from staff one another and to quarantine books. This rendering was pre-pandemic when we had our circulation desk tucked under the steps and the um, business center to the right of it. Since then, we've made some changes. We've moved the business center to the opposite side of the room and we've put the circulation area where that was so that staff members had lots of room to move around separate from one another and areas if we ever have to quarantine our books again. Today's modern library is open and flexible, serving as a community hub where people can come and gather. Yes, it's still a place where you can come and borrow materials, conduct research, but today's public library is so much more. It's a place where both children and adults can come to interact with others, to learn, to meet, to relax, to visit with friends, and it provides an opportunity for other community organizations to come and meet their community in a space that is open and welcoming to them. Our new library in Yule Plaza will provide this open, flexible design so that the space can change as our needs in a public library changes. Our new home will be colorful, comforting, and welcoming. Plus, for the first time, it will be totally ADA accessible. And our, our belief will remain the same, that it will always be a place that welcomes everyone, no matter what their background, what their situation, what their circumstances, all are welcome to the library. Some new libraries can offer state-of-the-art state technology, low staff patron ratios, and other fancy library bells and whistles. As Aaron informed you, our funding doesn't allow that to happen. So as we have created this new building, we have been very aware of our budget restraints, and we have looked closely at what the needs of this community are before we decide to add something. We want to make sure that we use our dollars wisely to provide what this community needs, not what 
it would be nice in some other part of the country. Our first floor will feature the business and reference center. We're putting them together so that we tear down barriers. People didn't feel comfortable coming into our business center on Duke Street because they thought that they had to be an entrepreneur. We don't want people to feel that way. Business, our business center is really just a different arm of reference work. So we thought we would combine them. It will be homed in a glass space. We will have four study rooms, a double bank of public computers, along with some empty desktops so that people can sit there to use their own devices if they so desire. We also will have comfortable seating. I will say there's not a comfortable chair in our library right now. <laughs> so anything is going to be more comfortable, but it's going to be comfortable and we will have comfortable study areas. And the two parking garages, the two elevators in the parking garage will open right into the first floor of the library's lobby when we are open. So you don't even have to go out into the rain to come into the library. We also will provide outside lockers where people can pick up their holds 24 seven. Even when the library is not closed, they will be able to obtain their materials. And the first floor will have two community spaces, a community room with a kitchenette and the boardroom. They can be combined to be one large space or they can be separated with a dividing wall. Each room will have state-of-the-art AV equipment in it and will be available for organizations throughout the community to use. The second floor will be home to our children's library with its beloved reading circle. If you are aware of the children's room now, we have a huge circle where children can play, crawl on. We have some books around there. I promise we're not taking the old grubby dirty one. We are redesigning it and putting a new one in. But when we d surveyed our um, patrons and asked what they would want in a new library, there were two things that was consistent. The reading circle had to be in it and our grandfather clock. So even in this modern building, we have found a home for our grandfather clock. Also in this space will be the Autism Resource Center in which we serve both our patrons who may be on the spectrum and their caregivers. And we will have two program rooms one that will open onto the library itself by, with glass accordion doors. So if we want one huge space, we will be able to have it in there. And also we will continue to have our family bathrooms. As public libraries uh, focus more and more on early literacy, LPL is no exception to that. This year, we created a new librarian position, early literacy librarian, whose focus is on our very youngest patrons from birth to school age. We're very excited to have her on board with us, but don't worry, adults. We have considered you in building this part of the library too. We will have a stroller parking area outside. So if you bring children or grandchildren in a stroller, you can safely park it and come into the library. Opposite our children's library will be our teen library, which will mirror the children's library. I am most excited about the space because it is the very first time in Lancaster Public Library's long history that we will have a dedicated space just for our tweens and teens. It will uh, contain two study rooms that they can use and furniture that is made for lounging. In between the two different libraries is an open space with wide open, uh, it's wide open reading space with comfortable seating in front of a bank of windows leading to our terrace. 
And yes, you heard right, Terrace. We are excited to say that we will have a Terrace overlooking Ewell Plaza where patrons can go out to relax and staff can hold program out on it. In addition to the second, on the second floor, we'll have an additional smaller meeting program room as well as our passport processing room. As you will see from this timeline, fingers crossed, toes crossed, arms and legs crossed, we will be in our new space come second quarter 2023. It's just down the road. It's been a long road to get there, but we are very, very excited. And we are well on our way to meeting our $10 million capital campaign goal, having raised over $8 million to date. This school reflects not only funding for the construction of the new space and its outfitting of it, but also to add to our endowment for years to come. We've received generous gifts from both community residents and community businesses, as well as grants from both foundations and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I am sure you cannot get as excited as I am about a new library, but I hope you will join us when it's time to cut the ribbon and come in. It will be a fabulous space for everyone to come, relax, enjoy, borrow a book, watch your plaza from a high. We hope that you will join us when that day comes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we can go ahead and take probably one or two questions from the group here, and then just know if you're joining us on the tour, there'll be lots of opportunities to ask things along the way. So does anyone have a question for Aaron or Alyssa? I'm just going to ask you if you talk in here, then the folks on the live stream can hear you as well. Thank you. How do you interact with the satellite with Mount Joy and Elizabethtown and Mainheim Township libraries? They are all independent libraries. Lancaster is a very unique situation in that there are 14 different libraries in the county. We all have our own budgets, our own boards. We are tied together through the library system of Lancaster County. They do back office work, but we are all very separate. Now, in our case, we do have a branch in Mountville, so we consider ourselves as one. They're part of all of our um, figures when we are doing programming and budgeting and all. And, we, and also materials are, are led between libraries, but it is not an intuitive structure at all. <laughs> and I, I, I should also say, we ha Lancaster Public Library has the largest collection of all the libraries in the county, it's, it's a very deep collection, and we do lend our materials, as Erin said, to all, all the libraries. We have a daily route where people come and pick up what has been asked for, and so our materials travel around. Um, I'll run over here to Kevin. I represent uh about 90 mentors from SCORE in the area. And uh, we're blessed to have the, the databases at the Duke Street Business Center. We, uh, we're up to about 80 new clients a month. Uh, entrepreneurs are in, are in business clients that need help. And we direct every one of them to your uh, Duke Street Center to, uh, to build their business plan or to, uh, plan to get a loan or whatnot. It's, it's a resource that we have at SCORE that not every chapter in the country has. There's 300 chapters in SCORE, and we're blessed to have it. So uh, thank you, and, and what you're doing for that uh, business center looks great. Uh, my question is, is there any enhancements to those four databases planned? Because those are really invaluable, but if there's a way to continue to evolve those, that would be great. It's a basis of funding. If we can find a more steady um, funding base for them, we certainly will do them. It's really hard. We have one 
um, database that um, they won't even give us numbers on how many people use it. So it's really hard to write a big check. We continue to do it. We will rethink it. But any suggestions that you have or if there's something else, we, we also have a really new reference staff right now. We've, we've had some change that people have left to go to other positions. And so we're changing that, that it's not just one of the reference librarians, it's all of them that will be trained and be versed on those databases so that there's always somebody in the library for one of your um, students to come and talk with. But we, you know, I would love to, now that we, it took us a while to get our second one on board, but now that he's there, we would love to sit down and brainstorm. Thank you. I'm gonna pass it up to Mitch. I know we have to get going so we can visit the site, but I was just curious, how do you move a library to make sure all the books book from the shelves time. go to the right location well, in the it, new it's space? It's only a block away, yeah, so right. we are expecting to see all of you. On moving day. On the, we hope it's February so that it can be during a snowstorm and we'll move one book. Now, we are, we are working with a moving company that has moved other libraries. They've moved the Millersville Library and several others, Hershey's Library. So they actually have built special um, crates like. So we will have somebody on one end taking them off the shelf and somebody on the other end that will put them up and put them on exactly as is, so they say. <laughs> but out of that $10 million budget, the, the moving is not an insignificant part of that. Um, it is, it is a, a big lift, without a doubt. All right, we'll take one more question here, and then we'll walk and talk. There you go. So where are you at this point in terms of the funding needed, and how and who would one connect with if their organization or individually want to contribute? Oh, what a lovely question. Thank you. So we are, uh, we're at about $8 million. We just crossed over that threshold. So um, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, and, and a lot of that, um, you know, that includes the sale of our current building, some phenomenal grants that we received, some great uh, gifts from local donors. Um, so we're getting pretty close. Um, Jamie Hall, who's back there, she can make sure that anybody who is interested in talking about uh, making a gift can do so. And you know, we'll, we'll give you all the information you'd want and a whole lot more. As I keep telling people, it takes a village to build a library on so many levels. So we'll take everything from pennies on up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, let's thank Lissa and Erin for all the great information and all their success on the campaign so far. Uh, the, the video recording of today's talk will be available on our YouTube channel and website next week. So feel free to share that with all the folks who aren't here who don't know about what a great resource the library is. And uh, we will be meeting again on October 7th. And if you'd like to get invitations to all of our First Friday forums, you can become a ma member at uh, hourglasslancaster.org. But until then, does everyone have their closed-toed shoes on? We're going to walk to Yule Plaza and do a hard hat tour. I think everyone came prepared. So if you'd like to walk over with us, it is only about a five minute walk. We'll gather everyone together and we can head over together. If you wanna drive, you can park in Larry Cohen's new beautiful parking garage, right? The, the, Christian, Street, the Christian Street garage is right over there and you can meet us uh, in front of the new library and we'll go in and, and check it out. So looking and we forward will to that. Have hard hats for everybody. They it's we will. Happen. So we'll say bye to the folks on the live stream and anyone who wants to join the tour will head over. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.